Father, as we come to the Holy Word of God, we invite you to open our eyes to what you teach us. As we know that without the presence of the Spirit of God, we can turn this into words, but they're your words. And so we look to you. May you teach us now. We pray this. In the book of Haggai this morning, which if you're flipping through your Bibles trying to find, it's one of those books that's really hard to find. If you go to the beginning of the New Testament, you flip back three books, you'll find Haggai, it's one of the minor prophets. We began looking at that last, this last week under the title Lord of Hosts. You uh, come through Christmas just recently. I think we're about done for Christmas. We talked about we're going to take down the Christmas tree out here, so that's a good song. We've just come through Christmas, and you may have heard some of the famous, one of the famous songs that are, gets played at this time, Heaven's Messiah. It's that famous one. In that entire work, it takes large portions of the scripture and puts it to song. And it quotes a little piece of Haggai chapter 2. And it's in a section of the song in which it's calling for the glory of God to be revealed so that the people can see it and even enjoy it. And to enjoy it, the words of Haggai, chapter 2, get called out. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry lands, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. In other words, it's a call for God to shake everything so that the glory of God may be seen and even enjoyed by the people. Usually we don't put that with shaking, do we? Usually that's the idea of when things are going wrong. In Haggai, the historical situation is that the people of God have been defeated a couple of decades earlier. They were defeated, they were sent off into exile, they were punished by God. And now, a small remnant who has remained faithful to God has returned to Israel. And they're trying to reestablish the people. They start building a city. And when they first get there, they start putting together a temple. They, they, they make the altar in the center of where the temple had stood in the middle of Jerusalem. They, they outline where the walls are going to go. They start getting the foundation together, and then all of a sudden some opposition comes up, and they have to stop. A few years pass, and this prophet, Haggai, goes to the leadership, and says, the Lord of hosts. And he uses that expression, Lord of hosts, a way of expressing the immense, overwhelming power of his God. He uses that word to call the people back to obedience, back to the work that God had brought to them. So they started once again building the temple of God. The call on the people. You are to be waiting on God, which doesn't mean stopping everything. It actually means getting to work, but doing so not just in a way that we're getting to work, but getting to work, listening to God, being in prayer, being expectant for him to work. So 
and wait on God and start bringing things together. Well, construction goes for a few weeks and things are happening and then all of a sudden it's the holiday season. It's, it, it's time to take a little break. We're, we're coming into to fall weather. We're going through the things of Haggai and some dates are given at the beginning of the passage that we're going to read in a minute. And it makes clear that this is holiday time. See, there was a, a festival in the calendar called the, the, the Feast of Booths, the, the, which was basically a commemoration where they were supposed to go tenting, which kind of reminded them of the days in which God had led the people out of Egypt during the days of Moses, and they, they spent 40 years going through the wilderness, and they basically did have a, a solid roof. They, they lived in tents all the time, so they commemorated that. And they remembered God's great victory, and we're told in the book of Leviticus that the last day of this festival was supposed to be a special day in which everything stops in a special Sabbath day. And they commemorate God's great victory and bring them out. This is in the midst of, of them building the temple. They're having this day, this celebration where the, the families gather and all the, the neighbors get together and they start some fellowship time. And what happens when you get a whole lot of people together? You'd like to think it's always just remembering all the good times. But you get a lot of people together and often complaining starts. You get people together and all of a sudden somebody said something kind of negative about, oh man, I wish it was like this. And now it almost becomes in our spirit somehow, and I think this is part of the fallen nature, where we almost try to one-up one another almost. Oh yeah, that's bad. But you've got to get like that. Oh yeah, there's a problem there, but, but what, what I've noticed is even worse. And everybody is gathering together as a people on a day that they are supposed to be remembering God's great victory, on a day that they're just taking a, a short break from accomplishing God's plan, they, they stop to complain. Man, that temple we're building, it's not big enough. We can't really afford it. And you know what? The opposition that stopped us before, they're still around. There, there's going to be lots of problems. We should, we should be finished already. In fact, they may have wanted to be done this thing. I said this is the last day of the, the Feast of Booths. If you go into to Chronicles, to the book of Second Chronicles, the first temple was built by Solomon. Now, he was a king. He probably didn't do any work. But he put the orders out there anyways. So we call it Solomon's temple. temple. They build it and they dedicate it on the last day of the festival, Booths. This is the anniversary of them dedicating the first temple. And on this day in which they're remembering how great the temple was, on this day in which they're celebrating God's great victory, they're actually feeling in their spirits defeated. They're actually looking around and they're saying, God has done such great things in the past. Why is he violent? Why is he doing a great thing now? You know how it is sometimes when you start complaining, particularly about somebody around? You, you do so quietly because you don't want them to overhear, right? I kind of suspect that's, that, you know, they don't want, they don't want the high priest, the king, to hear their, their complaining. But you know who does overhear their complaints? God. 
And really, when they're complaining that this is all not good enough, they're really, God stuff says, to say, you are questioning whether I am confident. This is my plan. This is my design. Are you saying that I am not confident to run things? Are you questioning my ability, my power? God is stepping in and he's stopping them that because their perspective has turned negative. And he, through the prophet Haggai, is going to encourage them. You need to change from being frustrated to see all that is being accomplished. Turning from negative to strength. The people are discouraged midway through building. And Haggai comes with this message to remain strong because indeed they are in the presence of God. So Haggai chapter 2, starting verse 1. I know the print is a little small there, but I'm trying to get it over. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in the former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not it's nothing in your eye? If you go back to chapter 1, he starts by speaking to the political and religious leaders of the day. And now we not just speak to them, they're still dressed, but we now also speak to everyone. He speaks to the entire nation. And there's a bit of an echo. In this question, something that happens about a decade, decade and a half earlier in Ezra chapter 3. That's the story when they first get back to Jerusalem, they start laying the foundation, and they look at the foundation of the temple, and it says those who were older and remembered the temple from before started to weep because it looked terrible. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't as great as before. The younger ones were just excited that there was something. They start crying out with joy. And in Ezra chapter 3, it says, You couldn't distinguish, it was so noisy, who was upset and who was happy. And he, he's kind of picking up on that theme here. And after the disruptions of the years, they're starting to build again. But the same questions are starting to come up. building. It's not worthy what we've been planning and again, there's, there's thoughts that we can't afford this. It should be covered in gold and it's not. And the negativity starts to avalanche. Yeah, we don't like this. I'm doing this. I'm helping to build it. I'm doing my part. But they might even be saying, you know what, this building is good enough so maybe I don't even know what I'm doing. Complaints start, and a downward spiral is the fear. I don't know if they're quite at the stage of giving up. That's not really brought up in Haggai. But certainly this idea that what we're doing is not good enough. And this focus shifts. From obedience to the Lord of hosts to what is wrong. What might have started off as an honest, realistic critique had suddenly turned to wine. Maybe it started off with saying, hey, maybe we should try this. Which is good. But as time goes on, all of a sudden, they turned into something very negative. 
It's amazing negative voices, aren't they? You get, you're doing something. And 20 people walk up and pat you on the shoulder and say, good job. And one person walks up and says something negative. What voice is going to play in your head all day? I, I, I know this is true for me. I can hear 20 people say something positive, and one person say something negative. The voice that gets played in my head, the tape that's going over and over in my mind, it's, it's, it's that negative one, isn't it? We tend to hear those negative voices much stronger. And it becomes very powerful when that negative voice is kind of a self Criticism. When, when we start to say to ourselves something along the lines that is very negative. In, in James, in the New Testament, it talks about the tongue. And this can include the things that we say to ourselves. It's a, it could be, it's such a little thing, but it's like a spark that can burn down a great forest. Negative can derail so quickly. It can be the words we hear from somebody else, it can be the words we're telling to ourselves. And, and, and God is stepping in. And I really think the idea that we're getting here is God is saying, I see that you don't think what I'm doing is good enough. Because ultimately, he's the one in charge. The natural part of us, part of this corrupt, sinful nature that we find ourselves in, it is so easy to focus on what is discouraging. takes the overwhelming work of the Holy Spirit to help us remain focused on the God who is powerful and on the God who is majestic. <coughs> That's the call here. And God continues in verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat. The high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. It is remarkable how often we find in scriptures the command to be strong and to not fear. And the simple reason why we are not to fear is because we are connected to the all-powerful God. Now, I read a little bit earlier that the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is speaking to Joshua, get ready to obey, and he starts to bring up, you're going to have conflict, you're going to have problems, there's going to be struggles. Get ready to obey. To be strong and courageous. And then he says, For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In 1 Chronicles 28, it's kind of a, a similar type of uh, situation in which King David is calling his son Solomon, the guy who's going to become king soon, in front of him. And he starts listing off all sorts of things that are going to go right and wrong. And he says this song to Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28. Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. you go to Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul's talking about stepping up and taking a place in this Christian life. And then 
he launches into a talk about putting on the armor of God. A very familiar passage, a famous passage, which is take on the armor of God, which is done by bringing the Holy Spirit into our lives, and the connection between armor of God and, and taking up your place in God's world is this, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's kind of this reoccurring theme here. We're to be strong and not fearful because of the presence of God. Anybody's ever done sports? The coach always wants to get up and give a great pep talk. Right? Encourage that in the face of, of, of difficulties and discouragement, you can do it. We find that in other parts of life. Uh, what maybe most famous pep talks of all time was Winston Churchill back in, in June of 1940 when it, it looked like defeat was certain. And he made his famous speech in which he said that the British Empire and its Commonwealth lasts for a thousand years. Men will still say this was their finest hour. Great pep talk. And you know what? That's not what the Bible is doing. The Bible is not meant to say, here is a tough time, but there's still a job to do. Go out and do it. So I tried to say, do you know what? You might run across difficulties, but, you know, for the sake of the kids, inspire them to keep going. That's a good pep talk. Be strong. Work. For I am with you. This is all about the presence of God. Since this was this festival of this, this was this uh, commemoration of days when uh, the people of God are wandering through the desert. You, you can go back and you can find these stories in Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the remarkable thing is the people would look up. And if it was nighttime, they would see a pillar of fire. And if it was daytime, they'd see a cloud. It was a symbol of the presence of God. See the festival that they're in the middle of celebrating is all about God is with me. Said it was on the anniversary of the, of the day in which Solomon's temple is dedicated. And on that day, they have a great worship service. And the temple is filled with a cloud. And it's the glory of God. Reminder the presence of They're going through this day all about God being present in really difficult moments. Those moments where obedience might be hard. But the remarkable thing is when we are obedient, when it's hard, we often discover God there. And those hard moments can be the greatest moments of learning. We see not just what can be accomplished, but we can see something much more important, and that's the fact that God is here. That God is with you. Remember, a number of years ago now, done some work with an organization that had worked in, historically at least, had worked in the school system, um, trying to bring the gospel in the, in the schools, and as happens in our day and age, they lost the ability to be in the schools, and I continue to work with them. They're, they continue to exist as an organization, 
And I remember very clearly one day them having a little bit of a drive from where they usually <coughs> met to, to where my church was at that time, about a half hour drive. And they suddenly decided they, they wanted to pray with me about bringing the gospel to kids. And so they drove a half hour. The only problem was they didn't phone me to see you know, am I available at that particular moment. But they showed up at my door and stopped me and asked if we could take time to pray because nobody was doing anything for the school kids. The problem was I was busy at that moment. I was actually in the middle of giving a devotional to about 60% of the school kids who attended the public school. They were in the church. We were doing an event for them, a multi-church event. And I was actually bringing the gospel to them as they showed up and they Waved me down as I'm in front of all the kids and said, come here. And didn't even quite get the irony that they were interrupting bringing the gospel to kids because they were so concerned with what was negative. They were good people, good. The hearts were in the right place. But sometimes we can become so enamored with what's wrong that we miss what God's doing. That we miss that God is doing something quite remarkable. To the point that when we can become so discouraged, we can give up. But at times, we also have to look at those moments where maybe God is at work in a different way. Maybe say, maybe God is trying to steer to a new opportunity, push us to something harder and better. This last week, for the second time in a year, I finished up with speech therapy, and I'm hoping I'm forever done with this, but just some help overcoming you know, when I have trouble getting words out and saying certain words, and uh, part of what has been going on in my head is that occasionally I try to say a word and then all of a sudden my brain can't get it and there's a too long of a pause in my speech. And, and I've, I've had some great conversations with a the speech therapist. He's somebody who, who grew up going to church but isn't going to church anymore. And, and we've had some really deep spiritual discussions through our therapy be really positive. And he made a, a comment in my notes that he gave to me that fit in with this exactly. He said that it's easy to see those moments where you're forced to pause in speech as a defeat. Instead ask, and there is some real spiritual wisdom here from somebody who isn't going to church anymore. Instead, in that moment, ask God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me, in other words? And he's exactly right. That is a powerful thought, that in that moment, look at that. I'm waiting on God. What are you trying to teach me here? It is so easy to focus on the struggles that we miss the strength that comes as we learn to enjoy the glory of God. And Haggai is speaking to the religious leaders. He's speaking to the political leaders. He's speaking to all the people. And he, his, his message is very clear here. God is present. You're here. You might be looking at everything negative going on around you. You might be frustrated with everything. But pause. Stop for a minute. Look at the glory of God who is here. See what he is doing. See what he has done. And know that his spirit has not changed. 
is present now. See, God is enough for us. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. See, the people want to be obedient. The problem is they're looking around and all they can see is the frustrations, all they can see is what is missing. And God is stepping in and saying, hey, I'm not done yet. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, this passage is put in, it is quoted by the author of Hebrews. And it kind of expands on it, that this shaking might be part of a little bit of a shifting, sifting that is going on that may happen. For the eternal kingdom of God to be realized. So they're worried about all sorts of things. Part of their worry is financial. Nobody ever has financial worries anymore, right? But God says the treasures of the nations are going to flow with my quaking. All the silver, all the gold, they don't belong to the billionaires. They belong to me. Everything belongs to me. All creation belongs to me. The shaking of the nations, it's going to result in my glory. There is glory to come. This really hits on three different complaints that you see coming up. The first is you fear the nations. The nations that stopped the building previously. You fear the nations. They're going to be shaken. The nations will not last forever. My eternal kingdom will. Second one is you fear economics. You fear finances. And God says, but all the wealth belongs to me. I can make it go where it needs to. And the third worry I think they have is the worry that they haven't done well. This, this temple doesn't look as good as it once did. You fear you have not done well. And God says the glory of this place will be greater than in the past. It will be greater than the gold-filled temple you will remember. They're worried. They need preoccupied by seeing the things that frustrate them. They feel defeated. They feel threatened. They're hearing voices in the back of their heads speaking. They're hearing voices from other people to say it's not good enough. They may even say to each other, we just can't do this. We can't finish the work. And God comes along and says it needs to happen. And because something that I'm at work at, great things are going to occur. Certainly, it's so easy to get focused on what we can't do. <coughs> we miss that God has a little bit of a different perspective than us. That God might look at our situation with eternal eyes. And he might see good where we see something wrong. We find our, our satisfaction just being in the presence of God. We're all going to have moments where we struggle, where we fail. We're all going to have moments where we look and say, hey, the job I did wasn't good enough. 
We're all going to have moments where somebody else is quite quick to tell us, hey, you're not as good as so-and-so. God doesn't call on us to get everything right, to always be perfect. God calls on us to be obedient. God calls on us to rest in his presence and find our satisfaction in him, not on all the other voices out there. To be able to see a majestic, great God and know that there's something good to have that's happening. I'm not inclusion calling us to anything in particular. This is a short sermon series over the last three weeks, but it's about obedience. I'm not calling us to any one specific thing necessarily to be obedient to. I think it's something that, that God might be speaking into in our lives in a unique, individual way. But we do need to understand altogether that while it is really easy to become discouraged we don't use those discouragements as a moment to pull away, as a moment to give up. Maybe instead we need to see those moments that naturally discourage, those, those obstacles that come up as a sign that maybe I should be doing this. Promise in Scripture. Not a promise we really like. But a promise in there that in this world, there will always be trouble. So if there's no trouble, we're obviously wrong with God. We're obviously on the wrong track. But where there's trouble, maybe God is doing something quite remarkable in our lives. So what's God calling you to? It's to, to step out of faith and do something you didn't think you could ever do. Some ministry. I'm willing to teach the kids. I'm willing to step up and be involved with the, the youth. I'm willing to fill in the blank. Maybe, maybe what God's calling you to do is share your faith with your neighbor. To bring the hope of Jesus to somebody near you. Maybe he's calling you to help people. I don't know exactly what God's saying in your heart. I know there's things that he's always calling on me to do. There's little moments in which insight from God just appears in my head. And if it's a good thing, it's probably something I'm supposed to do. God doesn't want us just sitting back. But he wants us engaging with this world that so desperately needs hope. He wants us to be involved in a world that so desperately needs light. So I'm invite people today that we just need to invite God to once again lead you to the place he wants you to be a few moments, maybe a prayer. Come up and you want to pray with me? Pray with somebody else? You can. And just ask for the courage to be obedient. For the strength to do what he's calling you to. It's truly he is the king. And if he's the king, we want to be obedient. I'm going to invite our worship team forward. We're going to sing the song, King of Heaven. 